In my recent poll with over 75,000 responses, CSS topped the list as the most painful technology web developers have to work with. They say it's broken, chaotic, and too damn hard. There's even a conspiracy that it's bad by design to protect the app stores. But I think CSS is awesome. It's definitely bloated and difficult to learn comprehensively, but that's only because it's had to evolve over the last 25 years. It came out at a time when Netscape was the top browser, and the idea of a responsive layout was more than a decade away. As more browsers hit the market, they all implemented CSS in different ways, leading to code that works in one browser but not the other, requiring you, the developer, to write a bunch of confusing vendor prefixes in your code just to make it work across all browsers. So I totally get why you would hate CSS, but today is a therapy session, where you'll learn how to write clean CSS using modern features, while avoiding the bad code that you shouldn't have to write in 2021. If you're new here, like and subscribe, and leave your favorite CSS pro tip in the comments. I'll pick a few of them to win this one-of-a-kind t-shirt next week. The first thing you need to know is how to learn CSS. The way not to learn CSS is to use a framework like Bootstrap or Tailwind. They're sexy tools that can help you get a nice looking UI quickly, but if you use something like Tailwind in your project, it's like getting married. For one, you won't learn CSS fundamentals, you'll learn Tailwind. And two, if you ever change your mind, you'll have to go through a very nasty divorce. You want a divorce? I have wings, Tolly. I want to fly. When you learn basic CSS, you'll have more control over your code, creativity, and freedom. The best piece of advice that I didn't receive until well into my web development career was to learn the CSS box model, because when you understand it, everything else in the language starts to make more sense. In fact, it's so easy, I'll just teach you the box model right now. Think of every HTML element as a box. Inside that box, you have the content, which can have a width and height. You can add padding around that box to squeeze the content, then you can add a border around the outside, then additional invisible space around the border called a margin. Everything in CSS related to layout and position is influenced by the box model. If you open up Chrome DevTools, you can see how the box model is computed for any element on the page. And that brings me to tip number two. Don't use Chrome when debugging CSS. Instead, check out Firefox. Their DevTools are generally superior, especially when it comes to CSS. If I inspect an element, I have a breakdown of the box model like I do in Chrome, but I can also edit properties on it directly, and Firefox gives me a breakdown of all of the properties that are influencing the box model. It also provides useful annotations in the HTML, like when one element is causing another element to overflow, and Firefox also provides really nice graphics for flex and grid layout. Speaking of which, layout, or the positioning of elements relative to each other, has historically been one of the most challenging aspects of CSS, like the age-old question of of how do I center a div both horizontally and vertically. One option is to give the child absolute positioning, then move it to the bottom right corner by using the top and left properties, then translate it back 50% to put it in the center. That can work, but it's incredibly unintuitive. A much better approach with modern CSS is Flexbox, which allows you to create a flexible column or row anywhere in the UI. When an element has display flex, it also has an X and Y axis on which you can align its children. The children flow one way, which is known as the main axis, and can be aligned in the center with the justify content property. Perpendicular to that is the cross axis, and we can move our element to the center with the align items property. Flexbox is usually the first tool I reach for when it comes to layout, but it does have one major drawback. If you have a big complex UI with many intersecting rows and columns, you may end up with a lot of container or wrapper elements in your HTML. These elements have no semantic meaning and are just there so your CSS code has something to attach itself to. Luckily, there's a modern CSS feature called a grid that can obliterate much of your code. Unlike Flexbox, which only deals with individual columns and rows, Grid allows you to think about the big picture layout. If you've been a web developer for a long time, it may look familiar because it's very similar to table layout way back in the day. It's just much more developer friendly. When you set an element to display Grid, you can then define its children as a bunch of columns and rows. Columns have a width, which can be defined with the Grid Template Columns property. We have three values here, separated by spaces, which means our grid has three columns. Notice the FR value, or fractional unit, which will responsively share the available space with other columns in the grid. We can also define some rows, and now every element inside the grid will be positioned automatically. But the important thing to notice is the amount of HTML and CSS that we've eliminated, compared to Flexbox layout or, God forbid, table layout. Now, 90% of the time when we talk about responsive layouts, we're just talking about changing the width of something based on the available space on the device or viewport. There are many ways you might do that, 
For example, you might have an article that has a preferred width of 50%, but on small screens, you want to make it fixed at 200 pixels or fixed at 800 pixels on large screens. You could do that by writing media queries that will apply CSS conditionally based on the viewport size. The only problem with this is that media queries will make you want to off yourself as the project grows larger. The good news though is that you can turn the tables by using functions like min, max, and clamp. We could refactor this code to set the width to a clamped value that has a minimum of 200 pixels, a max of 600, and then a preferred value of 50%, turning 13 lines of code into one for a 92% code reduction. Speaking of code reduction, here's a little bonus tip. In CSS, we often end up with these very long, hard to read class names. But did you know that you can use emoji characters as class names? Instead of flexible container, why not just use a flex emoji? Or instead of red text, why not red lipstick? Is that a good idea? I don't know. Give it a try at your job and let me know what your boss says about it. We have sort of a problem here. <laughs> Yeah. Now this next tip is really going to blow your mind if you've ever had to code a responsive image or video that maintains a certain aspect ratio. I had to do this recently on Fireship IO to embed videos with a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, which requires this hack where you put 56.25% padding on the top, then give the child absolute positioning. Today, although it's not supported everywhere yet, we can use the aspect ratio property. Instead of that padding nonsense, we can just define the aspect ratio on the video and we're done. Eliminating CSS code is a big part of making it more enjoyable, but of equal importance is making your code more flexible so that refactoring is not a total nightmare. A great way to achieve that is with CSS custom properties or variables. Notice how we're using the same color value in multiple places. If we decide to change the color, we need to modify every line of code that references it. A better approach is to define a global variable on the root selector, which can then be referenced wherever it's needed. And now when you decide to change it, you only have to modify one line of code. Variables cascade like everything else in CSS, which means you can override them by redefining them somewhere deeper in the tree. You can also combine them to compose more complex values. For example, we might define our RGB color based on the value of three other variables. And this flexibility will really change your life by allowing you to quickly swap out different themes for your website. Now, CSS is not really a programming language in the traditional sense, but it does have the ability to run basic calculations using the calc function. It allows you to calculate a value with some basic math, but the really cool thing about it is that you can combine different units. Like you might want to subtract 50 pixels from the current viewport width. In our code here, we have an animation where elements drop in from the top, but we want to stagger them so they come in one after the other. One way to achieve that is by applying a different animation delay for every single element, but that's very repetitive and hard to refactor. A more sophisticated approach is to define an inline CSS variable for every item that defines its order. Then we can define the animation delay as a calculation of the order variable times 100 milliseconds. And now we can handle an infinite number of elements without increasing our CSS footprint, thanks to the combined powers of calc and variables. Now, I know I just said CSS is not a programming language, but did you know that it actually has a state management mechanism built into it? You can keep track of a running count in your CSS code without ever writing a line of JavaScript. If you want to number headings in your HTML, the naive way to do it is to manually add those numbers in the HTML itself. Because if you ever want to splice in a new heading, you'll have to renumber everything manually. A smarter approach might be a CSS counter. You can create a counter in your code using the counter reset property. Give it a name of anything you want, then increment it whenever the desired selector is applied. It'll start from zero, then add one to every H1 element in the DOM. And now you never have to worry about numbering things in your HTML. And that brings us to our final tip. When building a complex dropdown menu, you might assume that some JavaScript is involved to manage the open and close state of the menu. But you might be surprised at how far you can get with just plain CSS. Now, you're most likely familiar with the focus pseudo class, which is applied to an element when you go into a form input or click on a button. The problem is that when building a dropdown, you might use focus to open a menu, but then when you click on something inside that menu, it loses focus and closes. And that's when you reach for JavaScript to manage state. However, there's another pseudo class class called focus within, and it stays active if any children also have focus. And that one simple feature can eliminate a lot of JavaScript used to toggle on and off states. And with that, you have 10 ways to make your CSS code more enjoyable to work with. But remember those browser vendor prefixes I mentioned earlier in the video? Well, 
That stuff's like herpes. It's not going away. Luckily, we do have effective medications that will make it barely noticeable. A tool you should know about is PostCSS, which itself uses a tool called Auto Prefixer to add all the vendor prefixes automatically. In addition, it allows you to use modern CSS features even if they're not supported on your targeted browsers. In addition, you may look into preprocessors like SAS, LESS, or Stylus, but we'll save those for a future video. Make sure to be a subscriber and leave a comment below, because next week I'll announce the winners of the t-shirt giveaway. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.